Hello, all you beautiful reflections of the light, the light of this eternal good. We're going to continue on with um, the spiritual power of truth. I'll do chapter five here. I'm going to do a short meditation to lead into this, and we'll just... Um, we're recognizing the presence here that Joel speaks of practicing this presence and of course to truly appreciate Joel's work and know that his consciousness is present with us still and the consciousness of all the masters as he helped us understand the eternal nature of their life. To recognize that there's only God. There's God being. As we recognize that, it is our intelligence. It governs us. It goes before us to make the rough places smooth. He goes before us. Any path we are on goes to make the crooked places straight. But again, most importantly, that we are not trying to make something happen here. It's already done. We are bearing witness to this truth and to this light. Again, the symbol of the sun is such a great symbol of that. That light is pouring forth. 24 hours a day, whether we see it shining if we're on the other side of the world at the moment or not, it's shining and nothing can separate, separate that light from its source. The light that's touching us right now is from that source. It's infinite. It's eternal. So we aren't waiting for our good to come. There is no good absent. And we realize this truth as very practical in our lives. As we become receptive to it and allow it and let it be the presence of consciousness within us. We certainly see the evidence of it 
as many as of us in our group have discussed. It's here now. If we accept that and we give that gratitude and that recognition and knowing that it again as Joel points out that it's God that gives the that is the gratitude it's God that is the love but as we allow it to flow out from us and see it flowing out from all those we come in contact and realize that yes God is the source we aren't looking to be that love for someone. We are looking for God's love to flow through them to us. And we're looking for God's love to flow through us to them. It's no longer a personal life, a personal world. It's infinite. It's all. It's that allness that God is. And we don't try and box that into a particular amount or size or when or where. It's everywhere. It's here. It's there. It's there and it's here. It's everywhere. And so it is. Just let that flow out from us as our day progresses whatever task we have to fulfill we let God be our capacity and our ability and this is chapter 5 of spiritual power of truth it's the universal hypnotism we are not healers of the body our work does not change the body at all our work changes the consciousness of an individual. One of the great stumbling blocks is that most people have a definite idea of what it is they're seeking when they seek or ask for help. And of course, that may not fit at all in the spiritual picture. I have told my struggle having five practitioners help me to increase my business. With each practitioner, my business got worse until I didn't have any. Now, that surely looked like a lack of demonstration. However, you see, it was my perfect demonstration. Because only when I had no money left did I go into this work. I suppose if my business had prospered, this work would have been delayed or even prevented in this lifetime. So it is that many people come to us for help, but they have a definite idea of what it is they want. They have a definite idea of how harmony should appear in their experience. And sometimes even when. However, you see that really is not a part of our ministry. We do not aim at having instantaneous healings. They're wonderful when they take place, if they fulfill their spiritual mission. But that is not our object. Our object is the changing of consciousness. The changing of an individual's consciousness from a material sense of life to the spiritual awareness of life from a material sense of religion to a spiritual sense of religion, from a material sense of supply to a spiritual sense of supply. You see, 
We are the ones. When the right help is given, who should be responding in accordance with God's will. However, we fight this by having in our mind how the demonstration should come out. And when and to what extent and so on. It is like parents who sometimes write to me for help. Their son is responding to the military draft. Will I help them pass and get into the draft? Another parent is desirous of having their son flunk the draft. Now you see, you can't pray to God for both ways. A parent would soon be wrong or writing to you a letter if their son got accepted and then got himself injured or killed, asking, What did you do? I thought you were going to God for my son, and now look what's happened to him. No, even if they wanted it, we couldn't do that. Our realization would not be of a man in or out of the military. Our realization would be of Christ's identity, of God's fulfilling itself as the life of this individual. Then we will have to be satisfied with whatever direction that young, man, young man's path took. Now this can never be repeated to you too often, because over and over the temptation can be there. I must save this person's life. I must restore their sanity. I must bring about peace in their household. Actually, peace may be the worst thing to have in the household for their spiritual progress. So it is that we do not outline, we do not desire, neither do we judge, criticize, or condemn. We turn completely from the human scene with its good side and bad side, and we pray for the revelation of Christ in our consciousness. When I use the word Christ, understand that I mean your spiritual identity or God's spiritual plan for you, or spiritual illumination. In our Christian mysticism, we use the word Christ to mean that which you, in your true identity, are, the Son of God, the God, the child of God, the offspring of God. Actually, it would make no difference if we were to say, reveal Buddha, because it means exactly the same thing, enlightened one, or Christ self. So it makes no difference what our terminology may be. When we turn within, let us realize that we are turning within to behold the spiritual reality when humanhood is confronting us. When we have that sacred second of spiritual realization, which in us is interpreted to mean we have beheld the very Christ of God, the very spiritual reality of being, this then touches the consciousness of the patient or student and begins to transform it. You see, all experience is being transformed by the renewal of the mind, being renewed by the transforming of the mind. We are, in other words, changing our nature from the man of earth to the man who has his being in Christ. Now, there are two of us. There is the man of earth that we are as human beings, and there is the man who has his being in Christ, which is our true identity. Now, I'm going to explain to you how this all happened, how humanhood is perpetuated in us, and how it is overcome where spiritual identity is realized and demonstrated. This is not something you will give to your patients or to your students. This sometimes you will live with until you have actually demonstrated it in great measure. Otherwise, giving out what you haven't got will not benefit the other fellow and may deprive you. 
Do not give out spiritual truth that you yourself have not attained in some measure of realization. You have heard of subliminal perception. This was used in a form of advertising in which a message was flashed on a movie or television screen so quickly that the viewer never saw it. You never became conscious that it was taking place, either by sight or hearing, and yet all of a sudden you felt the urge to do what they told you to do. In one experiment, the audience was told in the midst of a movie picture to get up, go downstairs and buy soda and popcorn. In those few minutes, sales increased 57% over the normal sale of popcorn and soda. In other words, in other experiment, on television, a message was flashed, go to the telephone. You got up right in the middle of this interesting picture and you went to the telephone. When you got there, you wondered what you were doing and remembered that you didn't want to telephone anybody. And so you went back to your seat, not knowing that you had been acted upon. Your mind had been played upon. You had been used by the mentality of other people, and you had been made to obey their instructions. England was offered the first opportunity to buy this idea and passed it up, deciding that it wasn't interested. It was bought in New York and experimented with and has since been dropped. So far, all intents and purposes it may amount to nothing further in the world's history. However, it's going to serve an important point. Since with that, I'm going to illustrate why we are human beings. We are kept human beings, why we sin, why we have false appetites, why we are poor, why we are ever sick, and why we ev eventually die. It is all because of this very thing, subliminal perception. As you go back to the early books of the Infinite Way, you will see that it is written there that you are not responsible for any error touching your life, not even responsible for sins, for lack, for hate, for envy, or jealousy. You are not responsible for a bit of that. All of that is universal activity. The activity of that which Paul called the carnal mind. He summed it all up in that term, the carnal mind. Centuries later, Mrs. Eddy coined the term mortal mind. If you like, you can use some of those terms or terms that we have in the infinite way, like universal belief or universal hypnotism, or universal mesmerism. You can use anything you like, because what is happening is that all the sins, diseases, lacks, limitations, and old age, all of this is a part of the vast universal ignorance, or call it universal mind, not the divine mind. The universal mind of man the carnal mind or the mortal mind is pumping its thoughts, its beliefs, and its theories into you and into me. So it is, let us say, that a baby is born and before it can even think, it's placed in a drought, draft. And the next thing it has a, is a cold. Now, it wasn't the baby's wrong thinking that gave it a cold. You can't blame it on the nurse or parents because they weren't thinking of a cold or the baby either. However, the universal belief that getting in a draft gives a cold immediately operated in what they now call the subconscious mind, and the baby responded to it. In the same way, every carnal thought, whether of a material, mental, moral, or financial nature, every material thought Every thought of false ambition, greed, lust, hate, injustice, and in unkindness. Not one bit of that is yours or mine. 
It is all part of this vast mental illusion. If you want to call it that, and yet every human being is subject to it. Each one falls for some particular phase of it at whatever happens to be their weakest point. All this is brought about unconsciously on our part and probably unconsciously on anyone else's part. Now, there isn't such a person as a devil doing this to us in a personalized sense. And neither is there anybody in the world wicked enough to be capable of doing it to humanity. It is an aggregation. You might call it the sum total of everything that has happened since the days of Adam, of a selfish or personal nature that forms everything that has come up out of the original belief in two powers, good and evil. All of this sum total of evil is now floating around right in your room. Some of it has been brought in by nothing personal other than what we call the carnal mind. Some of it is in the room by virtue of radios or television that may be close by. You are not aware of it because it's not plugged in or audible. However, it's there and it's going through your room. So we are responsive. So we are responding to medical beliefs. We are responding even to theological beliefs. If you had an idea how many people are sick because of their fear of hell and damnation, of their fear of punishment, or their fear of God, all of which have been pumped into them since childhood then you should know that all manner of theories and beliefs are just lurking in the air and we know nothing about them the world knowing nothing of all of this wakes up one day and finds itself with a cold or wakes up the next day and finds itself with indigestion and then the next day desires a diamond that it can't afford and finally steals and so on when you've worked enough with the sins of mankind, you'll find out true it is that there isn't really a sinner in all the world. I have never yet met a person who could rightly be termed a sinner from the standpoint of really and truly wanting to sin. Every single one I have ever met, every single one of any degree, has revealed sooner or later that whatever it is that's happening through them they don't want any part of it, but they don't know how to be free of it. You would say the same thing about the ills that you suffer or the poverty that you suffer. You could say, certainly, I don't want any part of this. There is no part. Of, this is no part of me. This is no part of my will or my desire. Well, then, where does it come from? if you aren't doing it. You have to shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know. Now I'm telling you, it's coming out of the same area of consciousness that may be likened to the activity of subliminal perception. It is something being whispered into your consciousness or subconscious. You know nothing about it to respond to it. This is the discovery I made that started all of this work way far back in the early 1930s. I saw that there is no personal evil. I saw that evil is never personal and it can be separated from any individual once they themselves have realized that the time has come. The next step makes the healing work very easy. You see, this step makes it possible for you never to hold your patient or student in any form of condemnation, criticism, or judgment. And enables you to be free and enables you to free everyone that comes to you instantly the moment you know why this isn't your fault. 
this isn't your doing. You are not responsible for this. Right then, and there, you've lifted a great load. And you don't even have to voice it. You only have to think it. You have lifted such a load from your patient or student that their shoulders go back normally, quickly. They don't know why, but they feel a sense of freedom. It is a freedom you have lifted the burden of guilt and responsibility from their shoulders by realizing why this isn't you. This isn't a part of you. This is the carnal mind. Now you take the second step. Since God is, and since God is infinity, immortality, and eternality, and since God is omnipotence, the carnal mind isn't power, and it hasn't the power to express itself through us. Once we have realized God as the only power, the carnal mind can only operate in the consciousness of a person who has two powers, consciously or unconsciously, until they consciously renounce the power of evil and re recognize it as a non-power. Otherwise, it will operate in them. The very moment that you come along and realize that the carnal mind with its sum total of evil, sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, age, is a non-power, is only an illusory belief in the mind, the universal mind, but not in your mind or mine. It is then not a power. It exists the way 2 times 2 equals 5 exists. You see, 2 times 2 equals 5 is a tremendous power in the mind of the person who believes it because they always, they're always they always going to give out 5 for 4. And in the end, they'll be broke. However, once it is recognized that 2 times 2 is 5, is not an entity or an identity or a substance or a law. It's nothingness. You're free and your patient is free. Now at this stage of your spiritual unfoldment, if the carnal mind or somebody operating the subliminal perception were to tell you to do this, that, or the other thing, do you know that you wouldn't do it? You already know enough of the one mind that you would not respond to that suggestion. Even at this point, there are very many things for which this universal mind cannot find outlet through you. You are already at the point where you cannot be tempted to fall for many things that this world is falling for. You can't even be tempted to fear. You can't be tempted to fear a war. You can't be tempted to fear bombs. You can't be tempted to fear the next bit of infection or contagion or epidemic that you read about in the newspapers. In other words, the carnal mind has already lost a great deal of its power over you. If you were awakened in the morning and found yourself completely without funds, I doubt that you could be frightened because somewhere the thought would come, it makes no difference. God's manna falls every day. God's grace is my sufficiency and there would be no fear. Just think what would happen to the person not knowing this, who believed that lack was an actual condition. I am sure that most of you are already a, at a stage where you very seldom, if ever, have a cold or, or a flu or some of these ailments that are common to people through bad weather. I have already perceived 
since my trip to London that we do not have the proportion of rheumatism that is reported in the healing circles of England. When you speak of these healers, evangelic healers, and so forth, you find out that 80% of all the people that come to them are just crippled with rheumatism. Well, I haven't noticed any, 80% of any of our metaphysical meetings or classes or lectures. It shows you are, to that degree, free of the mesmeric suggestion that weather or climate has to produce these terrible rheumatic claims. So it lies within your power to attain 80 to 90 percent freedom and probably ultimately a hundred percent and we'll watch for that but at least 80 to 90 percent right now recognize this at as this of this as of this moment the carnal mind cannot find outlet through you or inlet to you since in your true being, in your Christhood, you are one with God. It is the impartations from God that constitute your bread, your wine, your water, your substance, your resurrection, the harmony of your being. In other words, I am consciously one with God and all that the Father hath is mine. And only that which is of the Father is mine. I am an instrument through which God appears on earth. There is no me. That which you identify as me is God appearing as me. It is the life of God, the soul of God the mind of God, the reality of God, the allness of God made individually manifest. My oneness with God constitutes my oneness with mind that was in Christ Jesus, with the very soul that is God. I am the inlet and the outlet for all that is heavenly and divine, and only that which is heavenly and divine. The devil cometh and findeth nothing in me, says the master. Mortal mind or carnal mind may present itself to me, but I am not home to it. I do not receive it or respond to it. I do not hear it, taste it, touch it or smell it for that which constitutes the carnal or mortal mind is not entity or identity but illusory belief appearance you might call it temptation the picture of mortality that presents itself to me is a temptation for me to believe in the entity and identity and reality of mortal creation. All this can be traced to the second chapter of Genesis. You see, in the first chapter, you have God's pure creation. However, in the second chapter, you have the creation of the carnal mind, including man, through whom temptation can operate. The man of the second chapter of Genesis is the human being or what Paul called the man of earth, who must die. Now, the man made in the image and likeness of God constitutes, constituted of all God's qualities. That is the man who has his being in Christ. When you determine that I shall live by the grace of God, not by external things or persons, that the grace of God is my sufficiency and that in the presence of God is my fullness of life and I no longer am dependent on man whose breath is in his nostrils and I am no longer dependent on thoughts or things 
since I am consciously one with my creative principle, God, spirit. Then your life is spiritually governed, spiritually guided, spiritually fed, and spiritually lived. From the moment that you recognize that all error is impersonal, never blame a person for any form of evil, yourself, or anyone else. Remember that every form of evil is as impersonal as every form of good. Never can you take credit for being good or just or benevolent or moral or honest or loyal or faithful. That's an impossibility. Whatever of such qualities we possess they are God qualities. They represent God ex expressing itself as our individual qualities, characteristics, and nature. Whatever evil may be expressing itself through you or me at any given moment is the degree in which we are accepting the carnal mind as power. And we are either ignorantly or carelessly permitting it to function in us. That is why the Master said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You've got to know it. You have to know it consciously until the carnal mind is completely dead in you. And you have to know it constantly this does not mean to set up two powers and start protecting yourself from one of them or fearing one of them. Remember, I have told you in the past that in the earliest days of Christian science, Mrs. Eddy recognized moral mind as a term denoting nothingness. It was only afterwards that students began to look on moral mind as if it were a power to be afraid of. They began to say, look what mortal mind is doing to me, or can you give me some protection from mortal mind today? Do you follow that? So mortal mind became the same power that in religious circles the devil had. The enlightened Christian scientist of today, the one who is still doing good healing work, is one who has never lost sight of the fact that mortal mind isn't a power, but a term denoting nothingness, not something to be fought or overcome or risen above or destroyed. There aren't many such healers because that term mortal mind has fooled so many. And where that hasn't fooled them, personalizing error has, so that you find some who fear Roman Catholicism, you find some who fear Judaism, some who fear Orientalism, and some who fear Communism. By personalizing it, they have made themselves victims of it. It is the same as if you were to go around fearing that you might steal. Just keep fearing enough and you probably would succumb sooner or later. Just drive a car, fearing an accident long enough, and I'm sure you can coax yourself into one. So it is, if you personalize error in any form, you are making yourself a victim of it, as well as your patients and students. That's why, why it is an error to say to a patient or student, you must be more loving, or you must be more forgiving, or you must be more grateful. That's all nonsense, because that is personalizing the error. If you find your patient is not loving, is not kind, is not gentle, is not spiritual, then relieve your patient of that burden by realizing these negative qualities don't belong to you. They're part of the carnal mind, and the carnal mind is the arm of flesh. Nothing. 
free your patient. Don't hold them in bondage. How often it happens that a patient says, my trouble is sens sensuality. Or the practitioner says, I've learned, discerned that you are too sensual. Now you see, that just pins it onto the individual and makes healing an impossibility. If you do detect those things, then it's only a sign that this individual is being handled by the subliminal perception, that universal or carnal mind, in that way. Then realize that this is an attribute of nothingness or the carnal mind. It cannot use the child of God as an avenue, as a channel, or as an instrument, because it's nothingness itself. No presence, no power, no law to sustain any such thing. Recognizing the fact that a human being is only a human being because the carnal mind is pumping itself into them and through them and is being accepted as a power. You know how to die daily to your humanhood. That is, by being very sure in the morning and certainly at night before you're sleeping that the so-called theories, opinions, beliefs, the whole of the carnal mind are not a power. The carnal mind has no avenue of expression, no law to sustain it or maintain it. I am one with God. I and my Father are one, and the qualities of God constitute my qualities. I am an instrument and an avenue through which, and as which, God appears on earth. The intelligence of God and the love of God and the wisdom of God and the grace of God. All of this finds expression in me, through me, as me, to all of this world, for I and the Father are one. end of chapter 5 and we'll just hold on to that truth and it was so important that we recognize in our daily travels whether it be on the road on a you know another vehicle remember what Joel teaches us always that that experience is in us we are not going up in an airplane or riding on a motorcycle. That experience is in us. The plane is in us. The motorcycle is in us, in our consciousness. And I have witnessed this so truly over the literally millions of miles that I've driven in business all over the U.S. and in other countries that that protection is always with us. I've watched traffic do crazy things, <laughs> but it always opens up a way for me to clear from a potential accident or anything like that. And we have to know again that everyone is protected in that way, not only us. Even walking on the road, watching traffic clear, for me to cross the street or anything like that. It's not miraculous. It's just God working in our life in every way, shape, and form. I watched it happen with me with my children in a foreign country. The protection we had always, that even from situations that became very harmful after we left, but that protection was there while we were there. And that is so important. We realize that for this world, that everywhere we are, and realize that protection is on the other side of the world, 
even if we're not there, it is there. So I hope you all enjoy and look forward to talking more soon. Many blessings.